what do people think OCD is versus what actually is OCD? Intrusive thoughts are unwanted and they're untrue. People who have OCD don't actually think those things. They're, they're not reflective of somebody's true feelings. There is a fair amount of crossover between OCD, both in terms of their traits, but also the co-occurrence of each diagnosis. I was able to have the clarity to then understand that I was on the autism spectrum, but it wouldn't have been without getting help and treatment for OCD first. And do you think that there should be any differences in treating OCD in autistic people? What if it's real? And what if the people who you talk to don't know that it's OCD? The idea of like going in and talking to somebody about how you're actually feeling and, and what you think the problem is, it, it can be really terrifying. When I did start to get help, I was shocked by how much time I had left in my day. I'm trying to be careful about how I say this, but you know, really struggling with like, is can I continue living like this? And uh, I just want people to know that there is hope. Good day and welcome to the 40 Audi podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. Today, we are going to be tackling the topic of autism and OCD. Last episode, we were talking to Neurodivergent, who is also in the chat today on this live stream, about low support needs, autism, the unique challenges that could be brought to individuals who are under the label of ASD1. Today, I'm joined by another fellow YouTuber on the platform, Claire from Woodshed Fairy. How are you doing today? Hi, thanks for having me, Thomas. I'm doing great. Of course. Of course. Um, I do remember that I was on your podcast a while ago. I can't remember what we were talking about, autism and streaming. Yeah, basically just, just about your life. That's what my podcast is all about, just talking to people about their lives and having a natural conversation. So I'm glad you remembered that you did it, though. That would worry me if you forgot. <laughs> I'm sure many people in the chat know who you are, but... For anybody who is who doesn't know who you are, would you like to give them a little bit of an introduction into who you are and what kind of stuff you do in the online autistic community? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, my name is Claire. I have a YouTube channel called Woodshed Theory. I make videos about what it is like to be a late diagnosed autistic person and also about anything that has to do with my special interest or that I want to. So that could be crafting videos, sewing videos, uh, just videos about my life and showing people what autism can look like in adults. So that's like basically that. what we do on my channel. Well, I suppose one question that a lot of people might have for you would be, why Woodshed Fairy? What's has that got to do with autism? Is there a meaning behind it? That's a great question that I get asked uh, fairly regularly. Uh, so my channel is named after, I don't know why I went so deep with it, but my channel is named after Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. There is a part where Frankenstein's creature es escapes their master and runs away into the, into the mountains, into the woods, and starts to reside in the woodshed that's connected to a family's home. During the year or so that the creature is there, they peer through into the crack into the cracks into the house to learn how to speak and read and they learn what it is to be human. So mm -hmm. that is how I feel about being a late diagnosed um, autistic person where I am kind of peering through the cracks of into like neurotypical life, mm -hmm. learning what it is to, I don't want to say be human, but how to communicate better with people, see what uh, my life is like compared to other people's life and kind of learn more about myself. So that that's kind of where the name came from. I love that. I think that's a great me metaphor. Would you say metaphor? Yeah, or I remember telling my mother reference. about it for the first time. And she said, did you come up with that yourself? It's <laughs> like, gee, mom. Wow. Okay, thanks. That's a good one. <laughs> I, yeah, I have seen um, films related to Frankenstein, but I'm not much of an avid reader myself. I tend to listen to audiobooks rather than... And when I do listen to 
audiobooks, they tend to be like uh, non-fiction, like science, yeah. psychology related stuff. I don't know if I finished Frankenstein. I think that I did, but it was in high school when I was getting ready for the SAT. And I know that because it was one of those books where they put the any SAT words on one side of the page and then hmm. the book on the other side. Uh, so, uh, no, I, I won't claim to be an avid reader at this point. I, I think I I do better with listening as well. It's funny that we're, we're talking about books because in the last, well, I mean, to be honest, for most of the time that I've been streaming, I've had lots of people come on and ask me to do like ASMR stuff. I was convinced by, by someone in the chat <laughs> to do some ASMR book readings like for, for, for adults and we're gonna I'm gonna do the recording for them, I'm gonna read the book and then they're gonna edit it and put it on like a another channel. <laughs> I think it's it a great be. idea. I think I think it's gonna it's gonna be huge. It's gonna be huge. Uh Neurogeezer mm. says Frankenstein's creature was abandoned by his creator. Well if that is correct and I'm wrong, then thank you for letting me know. According to the Mayo Clinic Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, or OCD, features a pattern of unwanted thoughts and fears known as obsessions. These obsessions lead you to do repetitive things, also called compulsions. Both these obsessions and compulsions can get in the way of daily activities and cause people with OCD a lot of distress. I know that's just a sort of a, an excerpt from sort of the scientific literature, but I suppose to bring the conversation bit, a bit more towards the air of lived experience, like what we do in a lot in the, these podcasts. What do people think OCD is versus what actually is OCD? What a great question. Um, as you know, many people think that OCD um, or OCD has become popularized with this idea that it means that you're very picky uh when it comes to certain how you like certain things yeah. um so mostly i think that it, that revolves around cleanliness for a lot of people the the idea that ocd means that you like things uh organized or cleaned in a certain way mm -hmm. so for me the the thing that um i've learned and that i think explains it the best is this question of Intrusive thoughts, and then the mm. question, what if? Uh, so this idea of having very intrusive thoughts, which can take many, many forms, and then confronting the thought with the question, what if? Then tying that into a behavior to help quell those intrusive thoughts. Mm -hmm. So if it was going to be like a cleaning OCD thing where it's like the faucet is not clean for me to turn it on yeah. to wash my hands. It be like the obsession part of it. Right. Like yeah. that would be, uh, so what would the intrusive thought be there? Well, what if I use that faucet and the germs on my hands cause illness for somebody or someone around me? And then they pass away because of that. I mean, there's no length to what an intrusive thought can go to. Then the compulsion of that obsessive thought would be, for that person, would be to clean the faucet until you felt that it was clean enough to continue with your life. So it's a mix of the intrusive thought and then tying that into the compulsion to. Mm -hmm. kind of quell the anxiety from that intrusive thought at its core ocd is an anxiety disorder so i suppose i have two questions like one is what is the difference between a thought and an, an intrusive thought like in in sort of the realm of ocd i would say intrusive thoughts are uh, false thoughts everybody has intrusive thoughts whether you have ocd mm -hmm. or not Somebody without OCD uh, will let that thought pass because they don't ascribe any anything to that thought. They're, they might think for a second, that's weird, moving on. For a person with OCD, the thought is sticky 
uh, almost like stepping in gum or something mm. where it's like, even like if you use the gum analogy, even if you stepped in gum on, and it was on your shoe, you might try to wipe it off really quick, but there's still the residue there. So like it becomes a part of your thought processes. The thought continues to get stronger and stronger. So it's not real. It's not real. It's not what it doesn't uh, reflect what you believe. Mm -hmm. But as that thought becomes more ingrained in your mind, and as you start to rely more and more on the compulsion to get that thought out of your mind, mm -hmm. the bond between those two things becomes stronger and it gets uh, worse and worse. So you will spend more and more time thinking about the intrusive thought. And yeah. more time taking part in the compulsion to get rid of the intrusive thought. I don't know if that answers your question, but no, hundred percent, like very much so. Um, I, I'm so, so happy we get to talk about this because it's something I do feel. I, at least I know. I think I know something about it, so <laughs> that feels good. I'm not a doctor. Should we have, do the medical <laughs> thing? I am not a doctor. I am just somebody who's diagnosed with OCD, and I, yes. nothing I say is to be confused with medical advice. I'm just sharing information that I have obtained with you, but do your own research and, and, and I, I'm sure Thomas will put this down in the, in the, a disclaimer down in yeah. the, okay, great. It will do. I, I suppose another aspect of what you were talking about was the, the compulsion element, because in, in my mind, the, the example that you gave about so sort of the, the dirty faucet or the, the tap, as we call it in the UK. If you had a behavior which was to clean the tap to make sure that it was germ-free, sort of appeared in my mind, I would just clean it until it looked clean. Whereas mm. I know from my experiences with other people in my life that, for example, they had a compulsive thought about um, the house set setting on fire and mm -hmm. their obsessive thought about that. And their compulsion was to check the door handle like mm -hmm. a certain number of times like it wasn't just right. to check the door handle to to make sure that it was sort of locked so that they could satisfy that thought they had to sort of do it a number of times like yeah mm -hmm. i suppose that that element's a bit a bit confusing to me like right yeah. so it isn't about it isn't about a ration, rational thought because it's not about uh something that's real it's about quelling the anxiety. I experienced um, a long period of, of my life where I was doing the checking with door handles, locks, etc. I can see with my own eyes if I've already locked the door. Or I yeah. could know that I've already locked the door. Um, but until it feels right, until it feels like I locked the door in the right way, that would be when I felt like I could stop. It's not rational. So yeah. if you could see that the, like I could see that the door is locked, stand in front of the door and be like, it's not good enough. What's good enough is if I check by locking and unlocking the door uh, until I feel comfortable. So for some people that sure. could be a certain number. Uh, other people's, it could just be, you know, now it feels right. But the more you engage in that behavior, the longer it might take you to move forward because mm. feelings don't actually matter. So, so, uh, you know, just as a, an aside there, like something that, uh, I did to help with the checking, cause it's not wrong to lock your door, right? It's not wrong no. to like lock your door before the end of the day or whatever. No, no, I have a lot of thoughts when I sort of exit to, to go out the drive you know, did I lock my house, but I'll go back right. and I'll check that it's locked and then I'll be okay with it. Right, right. But it, for somebody with OCD, it's not about just like, okay, checking once. That's a normal thing. Checking over and over and over again, because you want to feel some sort of fake assurance mm -hmm. that that becomes a problem. So often people will uh, say that they, they have OC, uh, OCD uh, but like uh, to a lesser extent, and that is possible where mm. there is more of a a spectrum of how how much it affects a person. So that to me is interesting because it is more of a some people do have OCD tendencies, 
that they may struggle with for a small amount of time in their life. And other people may have it for a long period of time. That may be a lifelong thing where they constantly have to remind themselves that this is an OCD thought. This is part of my illness. Um, and then move forward in life like that. So I did a podcast very like quite a long time ago with a, a good friend called Nick. Um, it's kind of a BBC um, journalist at the moment. And he was, we did a podcast particularly on a like, relationship OCD. Have you heard about that before? Yeah. I've, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. There are different kinds of OCD. Um, that all depends on what kind of intrusive thoughts that you have. And, you know, some of the big ones can be relational OCD, harm OCD, mm -hmm. uh, OCD that has to do with, you know, um, taboo sexual subjects. There's pure O, which means that you don't really have the compulsions um, or you do have compulsions, but they're more hidden. Um, mm. There is cleanliness OCD, uh, OCD that has to do with um, symmetry, symmetry OCD, mm. of having things uh, lined up in the correct way. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of different OCDs and uh, I, I am familiar with relationship OCD. Relationship OCD is more when you struggle with all different aspects of relationships. So it could be, should I be with my partner? It could be, am I really in love? Or do they really love me? So uh, anxiety that is around relationships mm. would be relationship OCD. That's interesting. Well, I, there was something that you said about lining up objects and my brain was like hmm that sounds a bit little bit little bit on the autism side of things it does yeah and, it um, does from, from what i've read there is a fair amount of crossover between ocd both in terms of their traits but also the co-occurrence of each diagnosis and mm -hmm. yeah it was part um, of my diagnosis journey uh when i was exploring autism when i realize that one of the bigger red flags, diagnostic flags was oh, OCD as a comorbidity of autism. It's, it's fairly common. From um, Dr. Megan Neff's page, they do, they do sort of a misdiagnosis Monday article that goes out on, on Instagram and it also goes out on the website. And she sort of highlights the crossover between different diagnoses the one that was that she was covering between autism and ocd the cross the crossover traits that she highlighted were uh, repetitive behaviors um insomnia difficulty with uncertainty uh, compulsions repetitive thinking and uh, substance abuse issues um, mm -hmm. I, I suppose what i'd really love to know from you is whether you think that your experiences as an autistic person with OCD might differ to perhaps an holistic person's experience with it. Do you think there's any sort of differences between the two? Gosh, I, you had sent me that question. I have done some thinking about it. And, and to be honest, I don't know that I have an answer. And I'm, I'm so sorry because I don't have any experience being a neurotypical <laughs> holistic yeah. person. So I would struggle to answer that question only because I don't have I don't have a framework to work from. As a person who is on the spectrum, I don't like to make assumptions. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I have an answer. I am so sorry because I no, I think okay. it might have something to do with like intensity of mm. of emotion and and how we feel things a bit uh, or more intensely than maybe a neurotypical person. However, I can't I can't say that to be sure, uh, sure. because I've met people who have OCD and are not autistic. I would never want to like degrade their experience with OCD because it can be such a a terrible thing to experience. So I don't I don't know. That's my answer to that question. Sorry, Thomas. <laughs> it's so good. I think I um, don't know how their experience is different. I know it's awful for everyone involved. So there's also there's differences between autistic people, so within that diagnosis, and also with OCD as well. So from from right. what you were saying I mean, before, some people can have you know they might have an issue that they're able to resolve over a few months of therapy, and other as I said, other people might 
struggle forever. Mm. So some people may find that medication helps. Some people may find that group therapy helps. To say that there's a difference, I don't ever want to make it see, especially because I've experienced, I've experienced that the the level of distress I've experienced from OCD. I would never want to like downplay that for ever anybody. So I'm not sure that I have an answer. I think there's um, it's interesting, like thinking about some of the behaviors that autistic people have when we sort of born and um so we we develop through life and thinking about well, i suppose that's that's very much explained with the crossover isn't it i just thought it'd be a good good question in, in case there was any particular things i that think we could... that as far as like how ocd develops in a person we're not exactly sure why it would develop in one person over another. I could see that an autistic person who already struggles with anxiety because of the sensory overwhelm and a different mm. uh, like neurological map of the brain, Certainty, I could see how there would the be overlap. And... Yeah, I could see mm. how there would be a predisposition to develop for things to develop more into the OCD realm. Mm. I, I could see that. Well, it's the, I think the, the origins of the question was, because I've been doing a lot of thinking recently about my experiences with depression, particularly when it comes to my functionality as a human mm-hmm. being, because because my depression tends to vary a lot, anywhere between, mostly, mostly it sits around moderate in terms of severity, but, um, it sort of ebbs and flows between mild to severe, and mm-hmm. I found that the symptoms of depression that are more apparent for, for people sort of later on in that severity are much more apparent to me early on, and some things are not not so apparent to me. So, like one of the ways that I know that I'm not doing very very good is when I experience the like re- real intense feelings of anhedonia. So, like difficulties feeling pleasure mm, if okay. I, I if i experience that and i lose interest in the things that i'm that i'm i have this that makes up a big part of my life i know that it's really bad but if i lose my executive functioning mm, it's not mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's just kind of a, a stable thing just you know that, that happens both in depression and autism but because i have that sort of innate difficulty with it it kind of props up a little bit sooner hmm. that's um i can but see I, what you I mean did, i did remember that you you mentioned something about thought distortions so maybe it might be good to perhaps touch on on that aspect of ocd sure i think this is good too because i think in the chat there was um well there there are several uh, somebody in the chat was saying something about like i don't actually think those things and i think that's very important to um just set like a hard line there and that um, intrusive thoughts are unwanted and they're untrue. People who have OCD don't actually think those things. They're, they're not reflective of somebody's true feelings. When it comes to thought distortions, OCD people may review a thought and then a thought distortion would be the wrong thinking behind that thought. So one thought distortion could be, you know, black and white thinking is, and that's mm-hmm. something that, you know, is, is an overlap with uh, people with OCD. It could be uh, attributing, attributing more value to a thought than uh, needs be, taking on more responsibility for a thought than, ne- uh, than necessary. So there are a lot of things where um, somebody with OCD may have an intrusive thought um, and then think about it incorrectly, and that would mm. kind of help it to get a little stickier within the brain. Like, for example, I'm try- you know I'm trying to think of it, you know it, it can be difficult for me sometimes to talk about OCD because I want to be careful with my uh, own illness about how I speak about it because I don't I'm I'm about eighty to ninety percent better than I used to be, and I'm so grateful for be- that. But um, I I would be lying if I said that I I don't still struggle. So kind of thinking about like things that are okay for me to talk about and Mm -hmm. boundaries there. But for example, like say, you know, you were driving along and you hit a road bump, but, you know, half, 
way down the next block, you're thinking like, how do I know I didn't run something over? So that would be kind of like a harm OCD thought. And uh, in your mind, you're thinking, I probably didn't. But what if, what if I did? So uh, the thought distortion would be kind of that what if I did. And a thought distortion would be, well, then I, uh, if I did, then I have responsibility to go back and check. So the compulsion then would be to go turn the car around, even Mm -hmm. if it took, even if you were running late or something, turn the car around and go check. And maybe one check wouldn't be enough. So you'd be circling the block until you felt comfortable and knew that you had not caused any harm. Yeah, thought distortions um, are pretty uh, interesting in that way. Yeah, all or nothing thinking, emotional reasoning, uh, taking on blame. Like these are all things that it can be really difficult. And, and thought distortions aren't only in OCD. They can be in other anxiety yeah. and mental issues as well. So. That's quite interesting. It's good that you pointed that out because, like, it's definitely not like consistent. But I do have some like irrational, f- f- rational thoughts that like prop up in my head like quite often, like mm-hmm. particularly around. But again, I don't know if it's it's just something that I've I've learned from you know years of being autistic. But you know, I'm very careful. Like, like although people tell me anyone that I meet tells me that I'm very easy to talk to and that I've got a kind face and I seem very friendly and stuff. I do also consistently like think that I've, that I've done something to upset someone all the time or like that Mm, I've mm -hmm. um, in like inadvertently like intimidated somebody by making too much eye contact. I I, I tried to change my voice in order for it to be higher so that it Mm. appeared more, more friendly. So that I could sort of offset that. I can get into states with my anxiety when it's real, really, really bad, where um, I have to like second guess myself on everything, and mm, I just like mm-hmm. it sort of goes around in my head. But uh, as you said, like you know, you're talking about the thought distortions being like a possible part of of other diagnoses. And right, right. Another thing I think that is important to talk about in the realm of OCD, which I I don't think is common knowledge, is that getting past the intrusive thought can take different forms. Um, So it can be checking, and that checking can be uh, physical or um, mental. Mm -hmm. It can also be in the form of reassurance seeking, which is something that I really used to struggle with a lot. A lot more than I do now. So, for example, like in you, I brought up relationship OCD. So reassurance seeking would be going to your partner and constantly asking, like, are we a good fit? Or do you love me? Or Mm. needing to hear or get reassurance from other people. Um, It can also take the form of reassurance in the form of confessing one's thoughts to a person so that they can reassure you that that isn't actually how you, that isn't real. Mm -hmm. And that in turn get, uh, gives you a respite from the anxiety. But then Mm -hmm. the issue with the reassurance seeking is that you become dependent on the reassurance seeking. So it's a form of checking. Um, but I think it's interesting to talk about that, um, The checking doesn't always have to, sometimes I run into people who don't even realize that maybe what they're dealing with is obsessive compulsive disorder because they just have this idea. It's just like autism. Like you've got one idea of what it looks like, but it can take many different forms. You know, after doing research and understanding what the different forms are, um, you know, and meeting different uh, uh, people who have really, really different forms of OCD, it all, it all comes back to the same process within the mind but it can look different very Mm. different from person to person just like autism in that way i suppose um like with so the diagnosis of ocd it has to be sort of a a prevalent part of your life and have like impact on your functioning to to degree would would you say or is that 
Yeah. I mean, getting diagnosed was very difficult uh, for me because I, like to an extent, if you would have asked me, like, do you have OCD pre-diagnosis? I would have been like, I, I think I kind of do. But I, at the time of diagnosis, I, I was not doing well. And I finally um, drug myself into get help. And I um, basically, uh, as, as somebody with OCD would do, confessed all of these thoughts and, and, and what I was dealing with to, to this like mental health intake counselor. Uh, and they were able to diagnose me with OCD right away and, you know, send me in to uh, get some psychiatric help. And the psychiatrist I met with next was like, did you know this is what they diagnosed you with? And I, I guess I had, I, they hadn't said that at the time. But yeah, it's very, it's very difficult to get help when you have OCD. It's a very secretive, um, it's a very secretive disorder. Many mm -hmm. people suffer in, in silence because of the nature of, the intrusive thoughts. These can be really terrible things that run through your mind and get stuck in your mind to the extent where you're afraid to uh, do research about it or talk about it out loud. Because even though you know that it's the furthest thing from what you would want or what you would do, what if it's real? And what if the people who you talk to don't know that? It's OCD. That, that's a really scary thing. So the idea of like going in and talking to somebody about how you're actually feeling and, and what you think the problem is, it, it can be really terrifying. And I, I, it was for me. I'm, I'm you, never huh? judgmental about people who haven't, who haven't gone and, and gotten help yet because I know how hard it can be to even uh, f find a safe place to talk about it. It could be very, very difficult for a sure. person. Like, what if you thought that something was so bad that like, what if they, what if I say it out loud, what if I get sent to jail? What if I like, even though those aren't, isn't what you want, but you're, you're like, what if all these intrusive thoughts are so bad that like you get disowned or all of these things, uh, well, I imagine what you, was, you were very, saying it's before, scary. it's scary, you know, what you were saying before about like, and not not necessarily always being like completely sort of logical both to yourself i imagine that, that a lot of people could make some unfavorable sort of characterizations of, about you for sort of having those thoughts especially because people don't understand what ocd is and i'm so grateful that i am currently in a place and in, in a location where people understand mental health a lot better than i um and in, in other locations of of the planet so um I could actually get some help because I feel that I had spoken about some of my um, tendencies and, and anxieties to other people throughout the years and had never gotten, no one had ever said OCD. No one had ever brought that up before. What I knew about it was from the very little that I had kind of observed in other places. Uh, but again, I, I would say I was even afraid to read about it. Mm. Um, on the internet, because it was like I didn't, I didn't really understand it, and I didn't know if it applied to me or not. So it's a very scary place to be, and I, I am so grateful uh, that I was able to get help because, because mm. of being able to get help and to, and to improve my life in that way, I was able to have the clarity to then understand that I was on the autism spectrum, and then and pick up from there as well but it wouldn't have been without getting help and treatment for OCD first. I do have, thank you for that, I do have another question. I don't know if it's something that you want to cover because I, I know that you said that, you know, it's something that's quite sort of personal for you and, and sort of exists for you at sort of this very moment. So if you don't want to answer it, it's all good. I know that from reading, OCD can both cause some very distressing effects on the individual as you said with like the anxiety but it can also cause some dysfunction in personal relationships work study possibly like when navigating independence so i'd love to know more about how ocd could affect you or, or could affect others if you don't if you don't feel like 
talking. No, I, I'm. I, I could. Or, I could talk about that. Um, so. It can affect. It, it does absolutely affect the person um, directly, obviously, but it also mm-hmm. affects the people who are in your life, right? Not all people. Uh, some people who have OCD obviously live and function alone, and some of that has to do with having such severe anxiety. Like, for example, if you have like a cleanliness issue. Like, how could you have people around you, right? Like, sure. it would be very difficult, and they would have to follow your compulsions. Uh, for me, I, I was shocked uh, when I when I did um, when I did start to get help. I was shocked by how much time I had left in my day, hours of time that I was not aware was going into the OCD. Um, mm-hmm. I felt like I had so much more time on my hands. The ability to uh, have conversations with people and be able to really listen, I, I would really struggle with that. And I, uh, some of that would have been from working through obsessive compulsive disorders, uh, especially, you know, you're so caught on one thought and unable to work through it that all I'm thinking about is, would have been how can I um, how can I work, uh, getting reassurance about this thought into the conversation instead of mm-hmm. actually listening to the conversation relationship wise, you know, uh, con- constantly asking for reassurance. Uh, a lot of people who deal with OCD might have an issue with the people around them, like constantly asking for reassurance, or they might have their one person and that's their reassurance person. Right. So yeah, for me, it took time out of my day. It, it made it hard to communicate with other people. It made it hard to move forward in different areas of my life because of the, the, the anxieties and fears that I was having. If, if it would get bad, it would, it would make it hard for, um, you know, I might have like a, a, a triggering thing happen and it, and, and just go into a, a head spin for, you know, it could be hours. It could be, uh, being unable to leave something alone for days, weeks. Um, you know, I, I personally would usually go through a distinct and different, uh, intrusive thought categories and like that would uh, that would affect my life differently for different periods of time it can cause uh, you to retreat you know that's something i hadn't talked about before you know there there are different ways of dealing with the intrusive thoughts there's the compulsions the reassurance seeking but then there's also you know not dealing with it at all and never you know if you never have to be confronted with something that might make the thoughts worse then you know why would you leave avoidance behavior basically like mm. why leave the house when i can be comfortable here and not have to have an issue so yeah it, it, i i don't mind talking about how it would affect somebody's life uh it's awful it is it is i would not i would not wish it on anybody i'm better now at like when i see people making a joke or misusing what it actually means. I'm like I'm better now at OCD kind of. Comments yeah, yeah. And, I'm better, I, and I, I'm better now at just kind of like taking a deep breath and understanding that that comes from ignorance, and it and mm-hmm. I get their thought about how it might be a little funny or whatever. I'm better at like taking a deep breath now, but like I wish that I I I could be ignorant and take it as a joke, but it's you know, it's, it's definitely just not hard, like. I experienced that with autism as well. Like, yeah, yeah. There seems to be a lot of sort of takes people outside the autistic community using. I mean, there are some people within it who, you know, you use the term too. And I'm not saying that everybody uses the term as doing so in a bad way, but like you see stuff like, oh, I'm a, I'm a bit tistic or like, I've got a touch of tism or like, you know, oh, yeah, some, like some tism autistic... riz and stuff like that. Yeah. You know? or it's like... Some people use it within the autistic community, which is, is, is fine, but it's kind of like, it's like where, where that comes from for people. It's like <laughs> for autistic people, it's just kind of a, a fun thing that we do. And then, but some people outside of that said community could be sort of using it in a bit of a derogatory way like to say that yeah, i've been thinking awkward, about or, that a lot recently mm. too because like you hear this like trope of like for autistic women it's like manic pixie dream girl right and <laughs> i haven't uh, heard about that <laughs> no you have you haven't right because there's no. this idea of like you like you know like in like 90s rom-coms like you got the 
neurotypical guy and he falls for like the manic pixie dream girl and like people equate that with being an autistic mm. woman and i'm like mm, no because if if that's how you view autistic women i think me personally like i'm quirky but i think in an unsettling way for most people so <laughs> it's not like a like a cool quirky it's more like a what is happening <laughs> kind of quirky so no I, I i get that as well i think there's there's a lot of creators out there who do sort of have have that kind of aesthetic so maybe like especially the popular creators um so maybe that kind of like misleads people to think like that we're all like this i mean it's it's one of the issues like anyway with you know well, it's, it's, it's like, like that idea of like making autism something that it's not, right? Like mm -hmm. making it into like autism equals quirky, cool, trendy. And it's like, it's like no. A fashion. Yeah, it's for like, people like who are actually. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I hate to use like hashtag actually autistic, right? But like for people <laughs> who are, you know, uh, who who really live live with autism like i don't think any of us really feel that way like I mean, maybe I you definitely do. maybe I thomas feel, I feel thinks like that he's weird. cool and quirky i well i i do like the label of weird that that kind of that gets me but um <laughs> yeah no i'm I, look i'm i'm weird so i totally get that well um i feel like we've we've strayed a little bit from the uh the ocd conversation but it was a welcome stray as usual oh yeah no i'm not i'm not upset about it uh, sometimes it's good when like i feel like when you're being so intense about a topic it's good to just take a breather so we can head back to ocd now it's, it's just interesting when, when you've been talking about it so you know as i said i've just been you know i wouldn't consider myself to 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 have ocd because it doesn't well as much as i know it doesn't have an effect, I would, but then I wouldn't know. But I have been drawing some like lanes of relatability to to what you've been talking about with the like, especially with reassurance from other people, because I definitely do that a lot. Like <laughs> it's like pretty consistent thing. Like, am I am I being an asshole? <laughs> like, am I am I doing something wrong? Was I rude? Am I am I being unwelcoming to people? Am I doing? Yeah, I think know? as an as an autistic person, I think it's pretty. I mean, I don't speak for all autistic people, but I think it's pretty normal to have those thoughts, especially, not especially, I think it's pretty normal as autistic uh, individuals to, to feel like that because we can't read what's going on, right? So mm. if you can't read someone's facial expressions or tone, or if you struggle well, to read it. Well, that's that's the weird thing because I, I don't really find much difficulty with that like i feel like when it comes to neurotypical communication i'm i'm pretty good at it because it's been like a real i've had a fascination with people who aren't autistic for a long time because i just find them so interesting and because they're different it's like a different brain to me it's not a different brain like in the grand scheme of things but different to me but even then that i can understand what's going on in the, on in the social situation and I can read all the body language and the facial expressions. I still seek the reassurance, like, despite all of that. Yeah. It's just like a sort of a leftover sort of emotional response that I have or worry or insecurity or whatever you want to call it around sort of social communication. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I would say kind of a good follow up to talking for you f from you talking about that uh, would be to talk about uh, if you know a person who has OCD. Uh, what is the best way? And I, I've had this question before. Like, what is the best way to help them? Yes. Or so how like, how to how to respond to them? And yeah. I would say, not feeding into the reassurance is the is the biggest thing that you can do to help somebody who is who is struggling. Having a conversation with that person and saying, you know, I. I, I know that you're maybe you're seeking reassurance right now um and calling out the what might be ocd instead of just giving the reassurance so mm -hmm. if they came to you asking for reassurance uh saying hey maybe maybe this is a this is an ocd 
thought or experience. Maybe we should take a step back from this and I don't want to give you reassurance right now. That can be very difficult for the person because they're looking for kind of their, the fix, right? They're looking for their fix. Uh, but that, that's probably the best way that you can help, mm. um, somebody who is, uh, struggling with OCD is you don't want to like uh, feed into the dependency that they may, that they may, the, like, the reassurance dependency. dependency. Yeah. Right. They're, you need to look at that as them checking with you and feeding into the compulsion. The, the mm. compulsion is them checking with you. So yeah, the best way to help somebody, I think, would be to read up on what somebody might be seeking reassurance for, understand the condition further, and then pointing out that maybe what they're having is what they're asking for is reassurance and then helping them understand their way through that this is maybe an intrusive thought and you're, you're asking for reassurance and not, no, you're okay. You're okay. Cause you might think you're helping them in that moment. Um, but actually in the long run, you're making it much, much worse for them. But that I guess would have to be a really, uh, a conversation between the yeah, two parties yeah. at first. Don't, don't go out, start and start, uh, diagnosing people. Maybe. people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was taking a little bit of a divergence. We had a, a, um, Super chat from Billy McDonald. He said, Hi, Billy. Am I, am I wrong at looking at autism like this? OCCSS, obsessive, compulsive, but not distressing, difficulty in communication, social sensory. Megan Ann got a decent video on her OCD. Do you know much about OS, OCCSS? No, I've never heard this term before. Obsessive, compulsive, but not distressive. Difficulty in communication, social and sensory. I tried to look it up, but it just says Orange County cactus, cactus and Succulent Society. <laughs> now that's something I would be into, but that's another story. Um, yeah, I think as far as, Billy, as far as the idea that those are some overlapping traits or tendencies... Uh, but I wouldn't say that 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 is like a definitive list. I think those are things that that can absolutely overlap, but they don't have to. Like you can mm. be you can be autistic and not have any of the overlapping traits. I mean, but that's hard to say too because then using words like obsessive, you know, autistic people have special interests, and that's that's part of autism. So I, I I'd say those are traits that can overlap, but um, also not an exhaustive list, and also not necessary not mm. it wouldn't be necessary for them to overlap on dr meganeff's um misdiagnosis monday they said that something that's a part of ocd which may not be a part of autism is four things persistent and unwanted thoughts or urges sensations and images as obsessions um so like the intrusive thoughts element maybe Right, right um, whereas the obsessions for autistic people could just be positive and wanted somebody mm. with ocd would have thoughts that were super negative and unwanted they also have uh, repetitive behavior but i imagine that they're not talking about stimming i imagine that they're talking about sort of compulsions to reduce anxiety associated with obsessions right it's um, interesting to think about that with the because with stimming you're doing repetitive behavior to uh, calm one's sensory needs. And in, in OCD, you are doing repetitive behavior to mm -hmm. calm oneself. However, I think the important thing to look at is, and again, I am not a doctor. So just rephrasing that, this is just my personal experience. Mm -hmm. Looking at where baseline, where is that anxiety coming from? If it's coming mm -hmm. from unwanted, uh, intrusive thoughts, then that would be tied to OCD. Yeah, uh, but if it's coming said from, about, uh, you said about the the direct relationship between compulsion and obsessions that was highlighted in the OCD part, right? Whereas, um, for example, if you you know maybe having some sensory overwhelm around noise or other mm. or the heat or something like that, that would be, and you're stemming to yeah. calm yourself yeah. in that way that would be that would be different so mm. i can see where there's there is a lot of overlap where we're doing the same things i think the the thing to remember is the it's kind of the the why is that why are those things happening yeah yeah 
But I do want to um, mention, uh, and I think this is very important for me to say, is that if you are listening and that you are struggling with OCD and you haven't had help, there is absolutely things that you can do to, if not completely recover, to really minimize your symptoms. There is absolutely help and treatment for OCD. Um, so I just want to encourage people that things can get better because I, I know that when I was really struggling and I was at my worst, I just... Uh, I thought that I'm trying to be careful about how I say this, but, you know, really struggling with like, is, can I continue living like this? Hmm. And uh, I just want people to know that there is hope. There is, there is hope that things can get better. And we could talk a little bit about where, where treatment is at, but um, I just want people yeah. to know that that's important. No, a hundred percent. I think it's, it's really valuable that you mentioned that because I think sometimes it's, it's, it's a bit of a, I don't know. There's, there's always, there always exists this like kind of this this double edged sword thing. Like it's like you don't want to talk about the negatives because you don't want to like, especially in the online spaces, because you don't want to like put put a put a downer on people. But then at the same time, if you talk about them, you can also relate to people who have those experiences and stuff. It's like a the thing that I have in, in my head, particularly when I'm talking about like negative, like aspects of like depression and stuff, it's like, um, it's a difficult line sometimes. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, on, on the, the topic of OCD, I suppose one question that I would like to ask is like, what, what is the, the general treatment for OCD? And do you think that there should be any differences in treating OCD in autistic people? That's such a great question. I first would like to start with a disclaimer that I am not a doctor. <laughs> so, um, so as far as my understanding, uh, for me, I, um, for a long time, was uh, taking medication. From my understanding and from what I was told from my doctor, uh, that, again, talk to your own doctor and get your own advice. I'm just, like, please, please. From my understanding, taking uh, high doses of SSRIs can really help uh, somebody who has OCD with uh, with the intrusive thoughts. It can really take the edge off. Something that my doctor had told me, which was very helpful, is that relying on medication wasn't going to get me there. Mm. It wasn't. It would probably get me forty to sixty percent of the way there, so um, like but the rest. Quieting down the the, the impact right. of them, but not so basically sort of how I felt like right. So like basically what I how I felt that the medication helped me was it quieted the thoughts and the anxiety to an extent where I could even start to tackle what was happening to me. Because at one point it was like I couldn't. I've I've gotten a bit emotional through several times throughout this uh for, through us speaking, but the uh, the the fact that I can talk about this right now without having a breakdown I think is a miracle. So I just want to be a testament to people that there there can be help. Um, so there is the there is medication that can help. Another thing that has been uh obviously people talk about like cognitive behavioral therapy a lot, um mm. and mindfulness and. Uh, and things like that. Th that is also a big help with treating OCD. Something that has also been shown to really help people with OCD, which is the scariest thing you could possibly do in such a secretive thing, such a secretive personal thing is group mm. therapy. Mm. So I, re I went through a lot of group therapy uh, with other people who had OCD, diagnosed OCD. And the, the reason why it is so helpful is because it's so secretive, sitting and talking about these things that you're so scared about and hearing that other people are going through the exact same thing, maybe a little bit different, but in general, the exact same thing that you're going through is very, very helpful. Um, so group therapy looked like for me, it was a series of lessons about what OCD was and how to combat it and how to think about it. For me, being able to listen and experience that with other people who were just as terrified as me to talk about it mm. and go through that with them and see that other people 
were also going through it as well. For me, that made it clinical. Like I have an illness that is clinical and I can look at it like that, where I can like look at my symptoms now and say like, oh, that is my illness and that's not me and help me separate those two things in a way that I think working on it by myself would not have. Talk to your doctor. I think group therapy can be extremely helpful when it comes to OCD. A couple of thoughts that kind of came up, which <clears throat> related to sort of OCD or any kind of treatment related to, to autism is that I've seen some stuff about when I interviewed Temple Grand and she, she was talking about this as well for, for some autistic people or in her experience, a lot of autistic people have some difficulty with high, high, high doses of SSRIs and my, myself, I'm not diagnosed with OCD, but I'm diagnosed with depression and anxiety and I have found that SSRIs particularly tend to ramp up my levels of anxiety. It's, just that it's, it's a bit yeah. of a difficult one. And was, I've seen some stuff around like paradoxical reactions with meds. And, yeah, I and think that's same. why it's so important to really work with your doctor. And mm. like I could, I could say all day like this would be helpful for you, but it does take a while to find – especially when there's a core, this is, and again, I was dealing with this before I ever knew I was on the autism spectrum. Personally, this is me saying this personally, not as a medical professional, finding a a medication that works for you is very personal. So Mm. working with your doctor is so important because you're balancing that, you know, what gives you more anxiety, what gives you less anxiety and what would work for one person with OCD and autism might not work for another. So it it really goes into, you know, being as open as you can with your, um, your medical professional that you're working with. Definitely. I I would also highlight that from my own experiences with my mental illness. Another one that I think someone, someone as well pointed out in the chat was um, like CBT. Um, I've heard sort of, mixed mixed sort of feelings from autistic people on cbt like yeah you know what i think that is yeah i think that is it's because of ebt as in what like emotional or what does e stand for dbt dialectical behavioral therapy okay um, i'm not as familiar with that so i believe uh, i can't remember straight off the top of my head but i believe that dialectical behavioral therapy is focused around changing behaviors but also accepting um parts of your parts of your behaviors as being sort of inherent which can be quite Mm. useful for for like therapy around autistic people but um, yeah i could see absolutely why and if i'm talking too much let me know um i can see (laughs) why um it would cause anxiety for somebody on the spectrum to think about cognitive behavioral therapy especially if you're trying to be more yourself yeah um and not suppress your autistic behaviors where i see a chain or where i see a difference in treating ocd behaviors is that many times it's it's not like when you're experiencing um ocd symptoms you're like oh that's OCD, especially when you might be really sick and undiagnosed, right? Like it could be very bad and you are not aware that what you're doing is an OC as is a compulsion or that the thoughts that you're having are intrusive thoughts. They're just really scary and really and and the behaviors are helping. Where cognitive behavioral therapy comes in with with OCD is really being able to step back and say Oh, the thing that I'm experiencing right now is the illness and not Mm. something that is tied to me. So I think that's where I I don't know if I'm making sense there, but I think that's where the difference is. Like with where it's like that is that is OCD, Mm. and I need to be cognitive. I need to be no. I need to know that that is OCD and not. A beha- it not a behavior or thought that is tied to me or me as a person or what I actually mm. want. I need to be able to take a step back and experience the anxiety and not ex- man, this is such a big topic, Thomas. I could talk about 
OCD <laughs> forever. Um, but and not and not uh, experience sit and experience the anxiety, sit with the anxiety, and and just work through the being uncomfortable a, instead of trying to get rid of the anxiety. So that's where that's where I see the difference between because I, I get what you're saying, where it's like. I, I I get it as an as an autistic person who's trying to discover more of like who am I if I've been masking my whole life who am I and I don't want to change my shut off my autism to help other people I think that that's different than um, being able to recognize and work through something where I obviously autism isn't an illness whereas mm. OCD is something that I I would consider a mental illness and working through it would be a a little bit different. I think someone someone said in in the chat about DBT being cooperating a lot more about the emotional aspects, sort of regulating mm. emotions around right certain things. But I imagine like the cognitive behavioral therapy is more about like the thoughts and the thinking and stuff. But even if you are autistic, sort of going through that, like if it's sort of focused around particularly around the OCD, that it might not be as much of a I'm not sure. Again, like I'm not right, a psychiatrist I'm, either. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I think what what I had to realize is that even being able to being able to spot that what I'm experiencing in that moment is obsessive compulsive disorder mm. and is tied to my struggle with that illness. That is, um, that's a very that's a learned behavior and having to learn to stop yourself and to kind of deal with it in that moment that that's something that you have to learn thoughts come now like do they just come right everyone has thoughts they just fill our minds so having to to take a step back and say oh no 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 um because most of the time you're already you know you're down the tracks already yeah. like you don't even know that you're on the train so to be able to practice mindfulness, step back and say, oh, this is what I'm experiencing while I'm experiencing, that's a, that's a skill set that has to be learned when combating OCD. It's not mm -hmm. something that you're just like, oh, yeah, I know when I'm, I always say like, you know, people don't know that they're mentally ill, right? Like people don't have, like, it's something you're experiencing. So how would you know? Well, um. Uh, is there anything else that you'd you'd like? To, I mean, I know we've been talking for a while, but is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we sort of wind down? No, I, I mean, I think we've talked about a lot of things. I mean, all of these things are just like um, they're like minute compared to the larger topic of um, of OCD. But I think one, thanks for talking about it. I I um, I think I said before uh, Thomas and I went live. Um, and, and and probably during the stream, like uh, it, it's it's taken a really long time for me to be in a place where I'm comfortable talking about this. I would not wish whatever I've experienced on anybody. So anything that I can do to help raise awareness and help another person who might be going through something similar to what I was going through, autistic or not to be able to realize that there is what is happening to them hmm. that to me that I, I, I could do that all day because I, I, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. So I hope that by speaking about this, somebody might see it and uh, understand that you are not alone, that there is help getting better is, was one of the hardest things I've ever done, but one of the most worth it things I've ever done. So I hope that I could leave that with somebody, you know, you can start by looking up, uh, you know, talking to your doctor about it, uh, and kind of starting from there, but there is absolutely help for what you're going through. Uh, some, some love for you in the, in the chat and definitely like it's been going, going through sort of neuroscience and doing my own sort of reading and psychology. I don't think it always gives you sort of the full picture on anything really. And I think there is a lot of use as with autism, sort of learning about kind of lived experience angles to it and some of the, the nuances. So it's been very informative for me. And um, I think definitely for, for, for a lot of people, they will find a lot of use in our podcast today. Would you be able to think about, um, do you have a song 
in mind that you would like oh, to share? No. I didn't ask oh, you no. ahead of time. You didn't I ask me ahead of time. You. And the funny part was, <laughs> the funny part about this is, I know that you ask people this. And I thought in the past, well, I hope he doesn't ask me this because I don't really oh, listen so to music very often. I'm, um, I will ask her. You know what? I'll, <laughs> I'll recommend, uh, can I just recommend the lo fi YouTube? lo-fi beats channel the one with the girl who the, just the like looks at while well, she's studying and, yeah. can i just do that because I, sure. I feel like that's sometimes i when i'm working i'll put that on this is going to sound really stupid but like i don't i don't listen to a lot of like i'll listen to the radio or like like you know i listen to lizzo while i like clean sometimes ariana grande but like i don't i'm not like a big music person you know when i was younger i was super into music and then um through a few experiences i kind of just stopped so i'm i apologize everyone <laughs> it's, right. it's okay it's good. well if you have enjoyed this very lovely podcast and you've found some use in it for yourself please make sure to rate this podcast if you're on a podcasting streaming service like google apple spotify and if you're on youtube make sure to subscribe like the video and uh, consider jumping over to my Instagram um, at Thomas Henley UK, as well as checking out my YouTube channel if you're on any of the streaming services, because I do do these podcasts live now. And if you want to sort of catch up on the previous full sort of uh, unedited live recordings, you can become a member for as little as 99p. It's as low as I could put it on the memberships. And you'll have access to all of those as long alongside a lot of videos ahead of time, as well as the uncut streams that I do um, throughout the week. So, uh, Claire, do you have any links that you would like to share with people? Uh, well, you could head over to my YouTube channel, which is Woodshed Theory. I also have woodshedtheory.com. Uh, it's Woodshed Theory everywhere. Instagram, Facebook group. Yeah. Hope, hope you join in on the fun. I also have a podcast called Autistic People Talking that seems yes. to be ramping up with some popularity. Uh, Thomas has been on that podcast if you want to check that out. I do uh, a weekly kind of chill update of my life and do something called Porch Coffee on Mondays. So lots of fun segments uh, that we'd love to have you for on my channel. So hope yeah, to some, see you there. Some pretty pretty notable guests on there so far and yeah thomas <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no we've go, had go. uh, uh orion kelly uh yeah. taylor heaton mm. thomas henley jen <laughs> from neurodivergent mike from uh, autistic af the list goes on irene from the thought spot ella from purple ella uh lots of great guests so definitely check that out 100%. Well, guys, this comes to the end of the episode. I hope you have enjoyed it. And from me, I hope you have a very good day. See you later. Bye. 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 Farewell. End of the clip. <laughs>